Hey everybody, Johnny here. In this video, we're going to take a deep dive into cloth simulations. We're going to use Blender 2.92 for this one, so let's dig into it. To begin, we're going to add a grid and set its divisions to 40. This will be our initial piece of cloth. You can add a cloth simulation in two different ways. First, you can go to the modifier stack, click on add modifier and cloth. This will add the cloth modifier to the stack and also create a physics object. You can get to that by going to the physics properties panel or clicking on the settings button in the cloth modifier. Undoing that, the second way to add a cloth simulation is in the physics properties window, click on the cloth button. This will achieve the same effect. If we look back in our modifiers tab, we see we have that cloth simulation there. If we start animation playback at this point, our cloth will fall off the scene as gravity affects it. Obviously, that isn't very helpful. So let's go ahead and add a floor for our cloth to land on. We're gonna add a plane, scale it up, and under the physics tab, click on collision. In the collision object, go down to the soft body and cloth section, and we're gonna turn up the friction to about 20. This is gonna help our cloth not slide around on the floor so much. Clicking on our cloth object, we're gonna go ahead and raise it up. Under viewport shading, I'm gonna change the color to random. This will help distinguish our objects a little better. Now let's go ahead and play back the animation. While the cloth hits the floor, it's still not very interesting. So let's jump into side view and rotate the cloth a little bit. Now if we play back the animation, it should be a little more interesting. Now that we have a working simulation, Let's look at the settings. Under the cloth modifier, the first thing we see is quality steps. You can think of quality steps as how many times per frame the cloth simulation is calculated. To think about it one way, if you were only calculating your cloth once per minute, and so you calculated its initial position, and then the next time you calculated anything was a minute later, its new position wouldn't be very accurate. But if we calculated it every second, instead of every 60 seconds, we'd get a lot more in-between information to go off of. So if your animation runs at 30 frames per second and your quality steps are 4, the position of your cloth is calculated 120 times every second. Now because we're only showing 30 frames a second, you only see every fourth iteration of that animation as it lines up with the rendered frames. But the simulation is way more accurate. 5 is the default and works pretty well. If you're having performance issues, you can lower this, but you'll sacrifice quality. You can increase it, but know that your simulation speeds will slow down. The speed multiplier adjusts the time at which time in your simulation runs in relation to real time of your overall animation. Say you're animating a superhero, but her cape should be flapping in slow motion. You could set the multiplier to 0.25 and it would flap at one quarter speed. Generally speaking, unless you're looking for a specific effect, the speed multiplier will stay at one. Moving on to the physical properties. The vertex mass is the mass of the vertices of our object. This is a tricky setting as it sort of affects the overall weight of the object and how the vertices pull against its internal springs. At this point, we're gonna make our scene a little more interesting. I'm gonna add a UV sphere and add a collision object. I'll also turn up the friction. Let's run this with the default vertex mass of 0.3 kilograms. As you can see, the cloth falls and conforms to the sphere. If we lower the mass to 0.01 and then run the simulation, you'll see the cloth floats down and doesn't warp as much. It's more like a piece of crepe paper. If we increase the mass to say something like 20 and rerun the simulation, you'll see that the cloth starts to stretch as it moves down, as the weight of the vertices start to overcome the power of the springs in the cloth. We can make this really extreme by moving up to say a weight of 100. The air viscosity adds more resistance in the air for a free falling cloth. This is good if you're trying to simulate the cloth in a substance like water. The bending mode is there for backwards compatibility. There are two models available, angular and linear. Linear is the old model, and Angular is the new model. We'll only be covering the Angular model in this video. Here you can see the four types of springs in the Angular model. The blue arrows represent tension, 
The red arrows represent compression, the cyan arrows represent shear, and the green arrows represent bending. The stiffness section controls how much these springs are resistant to their different types of movement. So increasing the tension stiffness prevents the blue arrows from being stretched outwards. Increasing compression will prevent the red arrows from being smushed inwards. Increasing shear will prevent faces from losing their overall shape, while increasing bending tension will prevent faces from bending on top of one another. The four settings for damping affect how much energy is absorbed along these four spring types. So for instance, in this case, if we had a vertex mass of 20, and we ran our simulation, as the simulation works its way down, you see that these faces start to stretch out. However, if we were to increase the tension and compression and shear, but leave the bending, you'll see that each face of this mesh retains its shape because the tension, compression, and shear springs are pretty well locked into place. It all depends on the type of material you're trying to simulate. If we skip down to the property weights section, here you see that you can provide a vertex group for these springs with a max value for each one. The structural group controls tension and compression, the shear group controls shear, and the bending group controls bending. There's also an additional group here that controls where the object is allowed to stretch or shrink. So if different parts of your cloth have different properties, you can set those here with vertex groups. Next, let's look at the collision section. First, we have a collision quality setting. The default of two is generally okay, but if your simulation has trouble, you can increase this at the expense of processing time. Object collisions are on by default. This allows the mesh to interact with other objects that have had a collision modifier added. Distance is a margin between the cloth and the collider to help prevent overlap. Let's go into side view. Here we can see the distance between the cloth and the floor. If we decrease the distance and rerun the simulation, we'll see that that gap is narrowed. If we need to, we can also increase that distance. The impulse clamping setting prevents your cloth simulations from exploding in tight situations. It does this by restricting the amount of movement after a collision happens. If you find that your mesh is going crazy in cramped areas, you can try turning up impulse clamping. You can also make part of your mesh ignore collisions with a vertex group. Here, I'll add this side of the mesh to a vertex group and set the vertex group to that group. Now if I run the simulation, you'll see that that half of the mesh falls through the collision object. If you have a lot of collision objects in a scene and you want a cloth object to only interact with certain ones, you can add those to a group. For instance, if I duplicate this sphere and move one of them into a new collection and set my collision collection to my collisions group, now when I run the simulation, you'll see that the cloth interacts with the object that was in the collision group, but completely ignores the one that wasn't. If I move this object into the collision group, if I rerun the simulation now, you see both affect the cloth. Another important setting for realism is self-collisions. By default, this option is off. That means a cloth can bend over and intersect itself. Depending on your situation, this may or may not be a problem. Self-collision adds processing time, so be aware of that turning it on can slow things down. Under the self-collision section, we can set how much friction the cloth has on itself, a distance margin much like the distance margin for object collisions, again impulse clamping if the cloth is being overreactive, and a vertex group for areas of our cloth that should be allowed to self-intersect. Up until this point, all of the settings have been along the faces of the objects, but sometimes you want to simulate something like a couch cushion or a bean bag. This is where internal springs come in. Here I've modeled this little rectangle. If I apply a cloth simulator to it, if I run this simulation, this happens to it. If I increase the vertex mass and run it again, you'll see that the whole object just collapses upon itself. If I turn on internal springs and run it again, I get this. 
internal springs are created from the backs of faces inside the model. If max spring creation length is zero, then if the internal springs can find the other side of the model within the max creation diversion angle, it will create an internal spring. Now, if you increase the max spring creation length above zero, you'll see that the object starts to collapse again. That's because internal springs will only be created between faces that are within 0.3 of each other. And in this case, the top and bottom of this model are about 0.9 away from each other. If I adjust this model so that this end is closer together, within 0.3 of each other, and this end is still 0.9 away from each other, and rerun this simulation, you'll see that this end retained its shape while this end did not. The option Check Surface Normals requires that the faces that are paired up with internal springs have opposite face normals. Generally speaking, you can leave this checked. Much like the face springs, you can set tension and compression stiffness and maximum values here. And as well, you can create a vertex group to control these springs. If I were to lower the compression of the internal springs to say 0.5 and rerun the simulation, you'll notice that the object distorts more when it hits the ground, as compared to 15 where it bounces back very quickly. Pressure works in a similar way to internal springs, except that instead of springs trying to keep a shape, pressure is trying to fill up the shape. By increasing the pressure, the object will start to expand, pushing against its internal springs, not unlike a balloon. The custom volume option allows you to have more control over the shape of your mesh by setting an initial volume for the object manually. The pressure scale is a multiplier of the air pressure outside the object. The lower this is, the harder the internal pressure needs to be to fill up the object. The higher the pressure scale, the more the object will expand. You can think of a low pressure scale as the object being under a lot of compressive force, where a high pressure scale is the object being in a partial vacuum. The fluid density is the density of the subject filling your object. If it's zero, it's the same density as the surrounding area. So if you're simulating something in air, a fluid density of zero means that the object is also being filled by air. However, if the fluid density is greater than zero, that means the fluid inside is heavier than air, like water. If the fluid density is less than zero, say negative 0.08, that means the, the fluid inside your object less dense than air and therefore will float, much like a helium balloon. If you'd like uneven pressure added to your object, you can control that with a vertex group. Objects that are non-manifold, meaning they have a hole in them, and have pressure applied actually will get a propulsive force, much like an untied balloon. So in this case, if I delete a few faces and run my simulation, as I turn up the pressure, my object flies away. Moving to the shape section, the pin group allows you to identify a vertex group for holding vertices in place. In the case of this mesh, I'm going to add this corner and this corner to a pinning group. Adding a vertex group, I'm going to choose this corner and this corner and assign them to the group. In my cloth modifier, I'll add the pin group. Now if I run the simulation by pressing play, you'll see that those two corners of the object stay put while the rest of it simulates. For better realism, in this case, I'll enable self-collisions. You can also use the vertex group to do partial pinning. So if I wanted this top piece to be able to bend back and forth a little bit, I could assign this top corner a weight of 0.5. Now when I rerun the simulation, we can see that that point moves some, but it's still attached to its initial position. Stiffness is a multiplier for all pinning values. Deleting this vertex group, I'm gonna add a new one. 
I will add this top corner. Running this simulation, I get the following result. Now if I wanted this bottom corner to be folded up and matched up with this top corner, I can use sewing. Sewing will take any loose edges and try to reduce their length to zero. So if I take this vertex and this vertex and press F, that will create a loose edge between these two vertices. Now if I enable sewing and run the simulation, you'll see it makes a bit of a mess. This is partially because the simulation is happening too quickly. By setting a max sewing force and rerunning the simulation, you'll see that the edges get pulled together much more slowly and end up with a much nicer result. The shrinking factor allows your mesh to expand or shrink. Setting it at zero means it will try to preserve its size. Setting the shrinking factor below zero allows your mesh to expand. Setting it above zero makes it shrink. If your object has shape keys, you'll need to use the dynamic mesh option to allow the simulation to work with those keys. Field weights give control over how external forces in your scene affect your objects. Up until this point, we've been using gravity to make our cloth fall down. If we set gravity and field weights to zero, we'll find that our cloth isn't pulled down at all. If we have things like forces, wind, fluid flows, turbulence, or other forces in our scene, their effect on the object can be controlled with these sliders. If you have a collection of forces in your scene that you want to affect your object and ignore all the others, you can put them in a collection and put it here under Effector Collection. Finally, we have the Cache section. This section will allow you to bake your cloth settings and save them to disk rather than calculating them on the fly. Once you've saved your file, when you bake a simulation, the data is put out on disk. That way it's always available. For instance, when I run this simulation, you'll see that it has put 150 frames in memory, 1.2 megabytes. If I were to close Blender and reopen it, none of that data would be available. I would have to recalculate this simulation. However, if I press bake, it runs through the entire simulation and then saves that data. If I were to close and reopen this file, those frames would still be in memory. If I want to recalculate these later, I simply delete the bake and recalculate. If I've already run through my simulation and gotten the frames in memory, I can always say current cache to bake. If I have multiple objects in my scene that I want to cache, I can bake all of them at once using the bake all dynamics. These are the basics of the cloth simulation. In other videos, we'll go into more specifically how to use it, but I just wanted to cover the basic settings and what they're there for. I hope you found this rundown helpful. If you're enjoying the channel, please hit subscribe. I hope this really inspires you to make something awesome. So until next time, I'll see you later.